I think that's probably a great transition to our keynote and feature speaker for this month is Drew Duggan from Jamf. Drew, if you want to go ahead and take the reins and introduce yourself, I think that would be great. Uh, let me know if you, you should be a host already um, and should be able to share your screen. Just let me know if we don't have that. Yeah, he doesn't need to share his screen. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't have a deck or anything. Um, just kind of more of a, a Q and A thing. Uh, I was I was asked to, uh, to kind of come in and just talk generically about uh, what it looks like to move from um, self-hosted or on-prem to Jamf Cloud. Um, a, a quick thing about me. Um, yeah, I, I see Scott on here. Uh, there's a few other names on here that I definitely names and faces that I definitely recognize from uh, my duration here at Jamf. Uh, quick. Quick bio on me, um, I'm Drew Dugan, I'm senior sales engineer at Jamf. Uh, I've been with Jamf since 2011, um, came up through the support ranks, uh, been on the, the dark side of sales for, uh, I don't know, eight or nine years now. Um, number of different capacities in support, uh, did dabbled a little bit in pro services, but mainly just um, the, the sales side, the people you don't want to talk to um, for a long time. Um, but definitely a number of recognizable names on here, um, just as, as I've, I've supported a number of different accounts over the years. Um, so a lot of different experiences in different areas of the company. Um, so very familiar with the Champ offering Apple ecosystem. So uh, thanks for inviting me to be a part of the conversation here. Yeah. Um, so a, kind of a quick, just out of curiosity for, for my sake, uh, since I'm kind of new to the group, um, how many people here, if you, if you can kind of a show of e hands, uh, how many people are still uh, self hosting, doing on prem hosting of your Jamf instance? Give a few seconds to find those. So you got a few people. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's not uncommon. Um, you know, I, I'm the the most common reason uh, that we have a lot of customers that are still or that are that are self hosted. Uh, easily the most the most common uh, the most common uh, reason we have is just you've been a Jamf customer for a long time. Um, you know, we didn't have a Jamf cloud offering even until probably. If I had to throw out a year, it's probably twenty. 14 somewhere around there before we even kind of offered something in jamf cloud um you know it wasn't something that most vendors even really offered um so it wasn't something that was out there um but now um of our i don't know 75 000 plus customers um we've got about 66 000 or so of those customers um are all jamf cloud um, of new customers that come on board, um, we are in the 98% of those are all going Jamf Cloud, um, just for a multitude of reasons. Um, the the easiest being that it's not a, you don't have to maintain anything. Um, there's no if you're a new customer, um, there's no price difference between hosting yourself or being on Jamf Cloud. So that's the easiest reasoning for being on prem. Um, the, if you're a new customer, the main, the pretty much the only reason why you would go self-hosting uh, is just for security reasons. Um, not that there's any uh, security concerns with Jamf Cloud. Uh, it's just that there's a kind of a lot of those customers. Uh, there's going to be a, a a requirement, more or less, think kind of government or yeah. There are some database access things. Um, but uh, the the main one that we see with most of our customers that are going on from uh, will, will be like uh, government contractors, that sort of thing that there's kind of a requirement to be on prem. Um, so when it kind of goes into the security conversation, that's one of the one of the the primary justifications. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And obviously, there's some other ones I see in the comments there. Um, some other some other uh, reasonings for doing that, too. Um, and in the in the grand scheme of things, when you do kind of a pro and con list, um, ultimately a lot of customers kind of the pros outweigh the the cons um, for that, especially when you get back into the pricing conversation. 
Um, that's kind of why we've seen most people, uh, or the large, large, large majority of customers going going uh, with a Jamf Cloud offering. But so over the years, is in the um, since we've had a cloud customer, cloud customers, or uh, sorry, a Jamf Cloud offering. Um, I've worked with a lot of customers over the years that have kind of gone through that process. Uh, so, um, you know, we've, there's a number of people on the call here that are are uh, self-hosting, uh, kind of here to answer some of those questions and um, do your research for y'all. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Drew, for the, the very in-depth introduction. Um, yeah, so we we wanted to bring Drew in the call just because we we had some questions on how this process worked and like what's happening in the back end and stuff like that. Um, so we're gonna do a little bit of an interview style type thing, and then after that, we'll do a Q and A with uh, the rest of the group. But kind of going into this, Drew, um, do you do you mind potentially, Drew, turning on your camera? Are you in a place? Oh yeah, to sure. Cool. Yeah, I'm just. Send it home. Spotlight us. Um, let me see if this will work. Wait, how, did, how does it work when we, um, is this working for people where it's- We see okay, both yeah, right now. Now we're both, we're both spotlit. Yeah, that's what it's supposed to look like. Perfect. We're still, uh, we've still been experimenting with the interview style. Usually we do like a whole keynote presentation, but we've like trying to do this more podcast style. If they're not um, both spotlit in the uh, top right corner, you can click on view and change it from gallery to speaker. Also, yeah. if you've got everybody on your screen right now. I wonder if we can force people to do that, but I don't know if you can. Yeah, we'll figure that out later. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a small problem. To to, yeah, to try to set up these like really big Zoom meetings as if they're like more of a uh, conference type thing. Um, so I think you did a great job already explaining what is on prem versus cloud hosted, Drew, um, and why might someone might want to. Actually, maybe I'll ask the first question: Why might a company want to migrate from on prem? to a Jamf cloud hosted server? Yeah, you know, I think there's there's really two main reasons. Um, one, the easy one is they don't want to have to be in charge of my of managing infrastructure. Um, you know, all of you on the call probably have had to deal with that over the years of dealing with change protocols internally of, you know, having to put in your tickets, whether you're actually managing the infrastructure or it's an entirely different team at the organization, if you're having to, um, it's a management solution. So it's, you're having to deal with coming in on weekends or staying late, something like that. Uh, even if it's not, even if Jamf may not be deemed like a, a, a primary solution or something like that, where you can do stuff during the day, Whatever it might be, um, regardless, not having to be in charge of those uh, of managing managing a tool set, um, the, the the back end piece of it. So that's easily uh, one one key cog of it, and especially you know like if the uh, if there's something that goes wrong on that piece, um, that's what you're paying for is somebody else to do that. If there's something something goes awry with that, that's ultimately what you're paying the Champ Online Services team to do. Um, and, you know, you think of the, the, all of the, it's not just you doing that. It's, it's also the, all the back and reporting things that you've built out and are maybe be paying service, paying subscription services for those, those reporting tools and all of that other stuff that you're building out that you're also having to maintain. And there's just ultimately technical debt that goes into maintaining different services like Jamf yourself and think of the other tools that are there. So that's that's the main, that's one of the, the main reasons. Um, the other one is we've become, um, over the years, we've been introducing more, more and more features that are dependent or that a requirement of it is that you are a cloud customer. Um, <clears throat> and one of those that has been a really big one for customers of late um, is uh, Microsoft conditional access or now device compliance. Um, that's a really, really big one for customers. Um, so 
I would guess that a number of you on this call uh, have at least explored, if not are already using conditional access. Um, but uh, and this is a change that isn't coming from us. This is one that uh, Microsoft, I'm sure you've seen in forums or have been uh, have seen in Jamf release notes or have heard from Microsoft. Um, basically, the API that we were using when we introduced uh, Mac OS conditional access uh, several years ago, Microsoft is shuttering. Um, so in order to do that, the modern uh, API that we have to use uh, is for this device compliance and a requirement for that is our cloud services connector. Um, so <clears throat> that is only accessible to our Jamf cloud customers. Um, <clears throat> so the there's other services that are that are um, enabled with that. Um, there's uh, the Intune integration, but then also a, a related one is if you're a Google shop, our Google Beyond Corp integration is, is uh, available for that. Um, there's, if you are wanting to use the Jamf Cloud Distribution Service, um, if you want to do that, that's, you can, today, if you're hosting yourself, you can, we support Jamf, or we support cloud distribution points, but you would have to provide your own, um, so if you wanted to have your own, provide your own AWS or something similar, Akamai, Rackspace, something like that, you could, that would just be an added cost that you would have to incur. Um, but it's included in your cost if you wanted to leverage the Jam Cloud Distribution Service, which the back end is just AWS. Um, there's also, um, as an alternative, if you wanted to be able to assign, uh, you know, scope your policies and profiles and what have you to, um, Azure AD or Google Groups, uh, you could do that. But another re a requirement of that would be that cloud services connector. So there's more and more functionality that we're that we're bringing in. Um, in addition, uh, one last big one is uh, the Jamf app installers. Um, so that's the kind of other big one. There's some there's some smaller ones that 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 don't need to mention, but those are kind of the big flashing neon light features that um, you only get if you're a Jamf cloud customer. Um, just because of the requirement that uh, that you have to have that cloud services connector. So those are the two main reasons why we're seeing organizations moving um, to that. And uh, the the feature set piece, uh, again, the that Microsoft change when they came out and they said that they're going to shutter it. Um, that's one that's moving a lot of organizations just because when you get into that compliant conversation, that's one that we have to have a, their they're having to implement device compliance, and that's something that is kind of a non-starter for a lot of the organizations that are kind of finally making the moves over um, to cloud. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's a lot of good reasons to move over. I think one of the biggest things, too, is like Jamf just keeps introducing new features that can only happen to new cloud customer or to cloud hosted customers. So we don't even know what's going to be happening in the future, but I think a lot of those will probably get added. Yeah, and you know, we said that a few, uh, several JNX ago. Um, I don't even know what year it was. Um, we said it in the keynote where we were gonna we were kind of pivoting to be a cloud first development organization, and uh, the first phase of that was we had to make sure that customers that were going to be in the cloud wouldn't lose functionality. Um, so that was um, you could deploy applications through. Um, through the cloud, uh, we had, we built out uh, the Jamf infrastructure manager. So if you wanted to tie in with LDAP, you still could. Um, we so we introduced the ADCS connector, so you could still deploy certificates if you needed to. Those sorts of things. So you weren't losing functionality if you moved to the cloud comparatively. Um, and then now we're in the uh, the next stage of that where. We are we're introducing new functionality that just in some of this stuff is just kind of a requirement, um, like connecting into Microsoft um, and Google and, and these different vendors for security reasons. Um, those vendors weren't going to had to have a incoming connection that met basic security standards. And if each individual organization was doing their own work. Um, that was something that they couldn't guarantee that those inbound connections were there, which was basically what the old API was. 
um, when everything is coming from the Jamf cloud infrastructure via the cloud services connector, um, Microsoft and Google and any other vendors that might be coming, those connections would be coming in through the services, the cloud services connector. They can have the they can have the peace of mind that we've been vetted for that. So that's just mm -hmm. kind of why or the why behind that. It's not that we want to be forcing people to do that. Um, it's just kind of the the nature of the relationships that we have as a vendor, as a as a verified vendor with these other um, partners that we have. Yeah, cool. Um, so let, let's say someone wants to move to Jamf Cloud. And I know like server migrations is probably a scary thing to most people. Like what goes into that? Are we going to have to wipe or re-enroll your iPhones, iPads, and Mac computers? No, you shouldn't have to. Um, a, lo a lot of people think they need to, um, but you really just have to get it uh, the MDM profile removed. Um, especially, well, actually, sorry. Um, assuming you don't have to change your your management URL, um, your end user shouldn't have to do anything. Um, if that's there, uh, basically the process is we can get a copy of your database, uh, upload that securely, obviously. Um, we get a copy of that, we upload that into the Jamf Cloud. Um, then we work with your networking team to just flip the switch on your DNS entry, um, assuming obviously that you have a fully qualified domain for your Jamf URL, which I'm assuming all of you do. Um, and then you point that DNS entry to the Jamf Cloud infrastructure that we, we provide all this to you. Um, but then you just flip that over and your end users are none the wiser. Uh, and then that's pretty much it. So you shouldn't have to re-enroll anything unless, you know, you want to have a different, um, unless you want to have a different URL. I've worked with a handful of kind of one-off customers that like they're going through rebranding or acquisitions where they need to kind of contractually are required to, you know, pivot off of, of old branding or something like that. But in the end, um, even if that is the case, a lot of them, I mean, it's an MDM profile with a URL. Does it really matter? You know, can we through attrition and slowly as we're, you know, replacing machines just as through a regular refresh process, can we just kind of do that the old way? Um, there's there's some conversations that we can be have that can be had to plan out differently. Um, but usually it's pretty seamless. I see a couple other comments uh, in there um, to that it was pretty seamless, but by and large, you shouldn't ever have to um, wipe devices or anything like that, um, unless for one-off purposes, there's a, there's a compelling need to. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. Um, and what does a typical engagement look like? So how, how much does it cost? How long will it take to schedule? And how long will the server be down for so that um, users won't be able to log in or be able to connect to Jam Pro? Sure. Um, the there is a required uh two thousand usd uh two thousand dollar engagement fee um, with jam professional services um for that and it's a four hour half day engagement Fully updated, um, you know, you, you can't be way behind. Uh, you've got to be on the current version. Um, you can maybe be like one version behind, but by and large, you've got to be on the most the most recent version. Um, that's the main thing, getting a copy of that. Um, but otherwise, we'd also have to kind of coordinate with your networking team for that DNS switch over. Um, but otherwise, it's just a four hour engagement. And then uh, um, your database isn't probably going to be all that large. Uh, there is a kind of max threshold for how large your database would be, um, which most customers, I've, I've worked with like one or two customers that we've had to kind of clean up, they've had to clean up the database, but that was just because they'd never really cleaned it up. So if you have if you have log flushing turned on, it's, shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be a problem. Um, so, you know, if you have an, a normal size database, the kind of maintenance window that we'd be dealing with for when we switch over um, shouldn't be very big. Um, 
uh, we'd be able to give you more specifics on that based off of uh, if, if you're ready to switch over. Uh, working with our pro services team, just me not being on the front lines, I don't have the specific time on that, but I, it shouldn't be more than, um, I mean, I'd ask maybe ask Jay how long his was, but I don't think that maintenance window should be more than probably 20 or 30 minutes um, if we've got all of our ducks in a row um, for that. But uh, maybe Jay in the comments, do you have any idea? Uh, or do you recall how long your maintenance window was when you did the switch over where like you couldn't log into the Jamf Pro console? I think we did it overnight. Okay. It was it was um, painless. The end users never really noticed it. And, you know, this is a school, so, you know, that it doesn't get a lot of use anyway. Um, but, you know, we were, we were having some pretty bad problems with the on-prem. And uh, so the solution that tech support came up with was, well, let's put you on a web instance. And so we moved over to hosted kind of against our will. And, um, but, you know, the process itself was, was really painless and uh, didn't require any downtime that I recall. Yeah, the, the main kind of maintenance flip is when you would switch over uh, the DNS entry. Um, so you can kind of manage that to your own extent. Um, the, the one kind of caveat to think to plan for is that you would have some kind of uh, data loss um, just because of when we got the copy of your database and then when we kind of flip that over just because anything that happened in between when that database happened, when that database backup was taken and then when we started updating that again. Um, so I think inventory updates, if any policies happen to execute that sort of thing, um, that would be the only thing. So you, we would want to plan for that, like you wouldn't want to be deploying new machines um, in that period. So if you did it overnight, probably wouldn't really matter. Um, things like that, that you'd want to just kind of think about, hey, let's not create new policies. Let's not, let's not make any changes to our configuration profiles. Let's not do, let's not de actively deploy any machines, those sorts of things that you'd want to plan for, and it's going to be environment by environment. But um, it, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be anything that, that's going to be a, a major issue. Yeah. Um, so let's say theoretically someone didn't want to shell out the $2,000 or maybe wait for the engagement to be scheduled. Is this a migration that someone could do on their own without the help of Jamf? No, uh, because we do have to use our, uh, online services team to, um, do that. So it is a, it is a required uh, engagement for that. Um, and I did, I, I forgot to answer the other part of the previous question as far as kind of timing wise. Oh yeah. Uh, it, it, it happens. Uh, it, like I said, it's a four hour engagement uh, and it takes, a uh, takes about two to three weeks for scheduling. Typically mm -hmm. um, it kind of depends on time of year uh, because like the summer is usually a pretty busy time for pro services teams probably not jam specific but just across any organization uh just the edu uh down season that's usually a pretty big time so kind of depends on when in the calendar you're doing it uh, but on average it's about every about two to three weeks is from time of purchase to uh, time of actually when the engagement happens gotcha cool um and obviously we've discussed the benefits of moving to the cloud but what are some of the reasons companies may want to consider staying on-prem? Um, there have been a handful of customers uh, that have had pretty heavy, um, that have had pretty heavy access to the database um, that have like, they've, they have just a ton of direct uh, direct queries to the database that the API can't replace. Mm -hmm. um, we've been working to kind of create some of that. Um, that those, like one of those was um, like they had some support workflows that they required access to file vault keys. And for security reasons, we just, we hadn't uh, provided access to that via the API. Yeah. Um, so they needed that for their service system for that. And that was a showstopper for them. So that, that had been keeping them from that. Um, so some of those were there um, for that. Um, that's, that's kind of one of the big, bigger showstoppers, but then that kind of 
gets into other conversations around like the that's that's obviously a con list and can we replace that or is that something that when we have those when they have those internal conversations does do the pros outweigh weigh the cons that's that's one of those um uh honestly it, it usually gets into more like contractual stuff uh or um different kind of security requirements um that that's why they ultimately don't don't do it um but um when even the security piece anymore um the the inability to do the conditional access workflow has completely flipped that conversation because not being able to do conditional access at some point in the future uh has been a total game changer for them yeah um, and some other things that users mentioned in the chat, um, Andre said that there were governmental restrictions in Europe. Um, I know we have like a lot of times people have problems with like moving data across borders, um, but you have specific, uh, you know, AWS, I mean, it's AWS that Jamf Cloud is built on. You have like AWS databases in Europe, right? Yeah. The European cut. Yeah, definitely. Uh, when we set up the instances, we ask you what hosting region you want. Um, so we do have GDPR compliant hosting regions. Um, we have them in uh, if we have them in Japan, uh, in Australia, uh, in Germany, in the UK, in East and West AWS data centers. So we do we are GDPR compliant in that sense also. Um, so when we do work with uh, a, a lot of the organizations we work with are multinational. So um, ultimately, those organizations just have to decide where they want their data. Um, and those organizations typically end up uh, choosing to have theirs hosted, uh, their databases hosted in in the EU. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one, one thing that Jay mentioned as well is speed and just the speed of the server being one of the things specifically the API is really, really slow. Okay. Yeah, a bit slower. Now, Jay, are you on, do you have like the base level Jamf cloud or um, are you, uh, what, what are the, Drew, you, I don't even know the names, like what are the different, cause I know you can upgrade Jamf cloud. You can have like a self-hosted instance and stuff like that, right? Yeah, we do have standard and we have a uh, premium cloud. Um, we do have a, a gov cloud too, if you needed to be like on a hosted on fed ramp and just really in there too. Mm -hmm. um, the, but I, I, I personally haven't really worked with it. There's no functional difference between our, our gov cloud customers and, and our premium cloud. It's really, it's literally just, it's hosted on AWS's uh, gov cloud infrastructure. Um, the, the main difference is uh, there's, uh it it shouldn't be different allocated resources um the premium cloud is if you needed to uh, there's seven or eight different features but the the big ticket items that are why customers would need to uh go with our champ premium cloud option is if you need to do uh um, versioning control standard cloud customers are just uh we communicate what that upgrade cycle is typically it's uh you get the notification that there's a new version of Jamf Pro out, like uh, version 1047 is coming out, uh, I think next week. Um, we just had our internal training on it uh, yesterday. So I think it's coming out next Tuesday, I believe. Um, and uh, so you get the notification and typically it's about a week and a half later um, that we, that we'll do that. Um, that will, that will just in mass upgrade to all of those, all of the, our standard cloud customers. Um, if you needed to do version and control, um, which a lot of on-prem customers, that's a, we need to be able to, just, we don't want to, we don't want to upgrade right away. We want to do our internal testing, which is totally understandable, um, especially if you're used to it. If that is something that you need to do, um, then uh, premium cloud would be your best option. Or from a security standpoint, if you needed to do something like uh, do IP whitelisting for access into the Jamf Pro console or the API. That would be something you needed to do, or that would be a premium cloud thing, or um, do custom SSL or custom ports. There's a couple other ones that would be premium cloud. Um, uh, I can't, I, I can't speak for um, performance on the on the API. Um, that's not something that I've that I've run into. 
Um, but uh, it's certainly something, uh, I don't know if it's widespread or not, um, or if it might be instance specific. So I don't know if you've opened up a ticket in the I, past, certainly do that. Yeah, I have. It's it's specifically okay. with MUT, you know, when we try to, to update stuff with MUT, if it's using oh, okay. the, the old style uh, API, especially, um, you know, it's doing maybe one call every three seconds. I mean, it's, okay. it's really drastically slower than the on-prem was. So like if you're doing something like uh, applying a name to all the devices and checking the box that enforces the name on, on iPads, it takes a really long time. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, may, I could maybe reach out to uh, Mike if it hasn't been, he's the guy who kind of co-wrote it, uh, see if he could try with a new API, see if it'd be any better or make it not be every three seconds. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure if there's performance specifically, if it's just direct API access, um, as opposed to the way that the MUT's written. Um, but the tech support people seem to think it has to do with the fact that we're using Google authentication, um, okay. and, and our active directory, uh, you know, we scope with active directory. So they think it might be related to that. Um, but you know, the, if it's basically, you know how there's two types of API calls that MUD can use. You know, it's like there's the classic, and then there's the new way. The new way stuff, it's still lightning fast. But anything okay. that has to go back to the classic, and, and maybe that's why uh, Steve and Laney said that they they're fast. If you can use the new APIs, it seems to be going fast. But for whatever reason, that thing where you have to re, you know, you want to apply the names to the um, devices and then check the box, that takes forever. Um, but then stuff like adding devices to groups, that's instant. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I know the when you when you're renaming a mobile device, it actually has to do an MDM command. So there's a bit more happening there. Um, so maybe that's the that's the piece that makes it longer. Um, Steven, Stefan, uh, Laney said that that's not the experience he's had with JF Cloud, but um, I don't know if you want to share whether or not you've done the rename. Uh, with that, or if you just were doing other stuff within MUT? No, and it's I, very, very limited experience with MUT. Um, I was just trying to replicate our prod instance to a, a test instance of Jamf that we have. They're both cloud hosted. And yeah, when I was using MUT, it seemed to move everything over really quick. Definitely. So it, it definitely wasn't like an item every three seconds. Yeah, since I don't use, we don't, we have our own internal tools and we don't necessarily use the MUT for anything. Um, I can't super speak to that, but I know, I know Chad has written scripts that will rename devices. We usually do it where we have it running in like a separate server, like a make.com server um, so that we can do it right when the device gets enrolled. So I guess we don't care too much about timing because it takes one second or three seconds it's happened that operation is going to be happening as soon as the device is enrolled so <laughs> yeah when you're trying to apply those names to a thousand devices though that three yeah. seconds makes a difference yeah we're we not in our environments but. uh and i see uh just to make sure we got reed's question um the uh you can still uh use your tradition your uh file share distribution points um, that is something that you could still use. Uh, you can also still use, you can use both. You can use a hybrid solution where um, you could uh, use like the Jamf Cloud distribution point as your primary distribution point. And then you can um, also use um, file share distribution points. Uh, I've worked with a number of customers that um, they use that for the majority of their customers, but then they have uh, locations that have uh, not the best internet access. Um, they have offices and, you know, you know, not the best spots. I want to sort of say where, but you can imagine um, and where they have to do, you know, syncing overnight and then pulling locally instead of over the internet because otherwise just simple packages would take quite a while to be downloading over the internet. So um, you can use both. But I guess if we want to get all of our, you know, we want to get everything in the cloud and you know, we want to just retire the on-prem service completely like, you know, the, the database, our database is relatively small, but then, you know, we have gigs and gigs of files on the distribution points. Like, how do those get migrated up? Yeah, there'd be a one time that you'd have to uh, upload them once. Um, that would be a one time thing. Uh, Jamf and admin made that pretty easy. Yep. yep. I was going to say that. Yeah, okay, you can cool. uh, 
there's a button to just you have to click on Jamf Cloud inside of Jamf Admin, um, and you can just click replicate, and it will go through the process of uploading all those packages. It's going to do it from your local computer. So as long as you have a really good connection on that local computer, the process might not take too long. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, great question. Is Jamf Admin still kind of like teetering on the edge of oblivion or are they still saying that they're going to get rid of it or is it going to stick around? Uh, it's <laughs> it's not something uh, we're, we're moving. A, we're, we're, um, we're looking, we're, uh, I don't know. My non-answer is, uh, um, it's something that we're trying to move away from the client apps. Um, the, the largest or the biggest, um, the biggest challenge that we've had historically, uh, was with, with most of our client apps has been just that, um, it was a challenge for our Jamf admins that weren't working primarily off of a Mac. Um, you know, you've, uh, in our spring event, we've, we talked about, uh, how we were moving uh, Jamf remote wasn't going to be a thing anymore. Um, so we are going to be able to do uh, remote assist through, on your Macs through the web application. Um, and you can anticipate some kind of alternative from Jamf admin uh, as well. Cool. Uh, one question I kind of wanted to get in here because I think it's interesting is, uh, Graham, you mentioned uh, that you're a multi-context. Um, and I'm curious, Drew, is there any way that multi-context tenants are able to move to Jamf Cloud, or is that kind of one of those limitations? That likely would be. Um, that would be a, a conversation that uh, you could have offline with uh, with your, your account SE to see kind of what the, the best option would be. Okay, thanks. I, uh, I think I've, I've had sort of preliminary conversations and it does sound like migrating uh, devices is the only way, um, which might not be the worst thing anyway, after six, seven years of, you know, building up cruft. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know the nice thing. The nice thing is with migration, um, there are a lot of really slick alternatives. Uh, or there, sorry, I should say there are a lot of slick options to make it a hell of a lot easier than it used to be. Um, uh, especially, I should say, than it used to be post introduction of user approved MDM. Um, you know, it used to be a lot easier with uh, when we could just kind of create a quick ad package and dump it into one Jamf instance. And you could have, if you're dumping it into different instances, you could have as many different quick ad packages for however many different Jamf instances you wanted. And you could just silently do it in the background and be done with it. Um, user approved MDM made that harder, uh, but there are some, uh, we've got some offerings for Jamf professional services. Um, for that, uh, Chris and I have had some conversations about step two. So there are definitely some options to make it a lot easier. Um, like we've got one where basically uh, Jamf PS would be able to work with you to create some packages to just, you can deploy that through your existing Jamf instance uh, and it, a package is deployed and it just gate, it walks the users through a, a kind of a workflow that just as easily as you can. Um, remove does an API call to wipe them or to remove the MDM profile from their existing one. Um, it's laid down, it's done the, the groundwork to, to uh, get it into the new one um, and then guides them through the process to get them in a user approved state um, for the new instance. So it, it makes it a lot easier because um, user approved really kind of threw, a, <laughs> threw a, a tire iron in your wheel uh, in your bike wheel before, uh, since that. So there's a lot of different options that, that make it a lot easier. Um, but yeah, the, the multi-context, um, I honestly, I haven't had anybody ask me about it, uh, since I've been in SC for it. Um, so I'd have to, uh, me personally, I'd have to double check with our, with our online services team. Um, because I don't know for sure if we would support it or not. Um, but, uh, that would be something that just reach out to your SC, uh, and, and they would be able to, um, get you a for sure answer. Cool. Thanks. I was yep. just curious, like I, I, 
I haven't seen it, but I've sort of heard something about this professional services um, package that you were talking about. Um, is there something like that or even a possibility to do that on iOS as well? Mm -hmm. yep. um, so without wiping devices? Yep. Okay. Yeah, and we can do it. It's not just uh, jamp instance, jamp instance to jamp instance. We can also do it from third party MDM as well. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, yeah. Especially you know the the elephant in the room with a lot of customers is if uh, with the uh, AirWatch Broadcom uh, acquisition or the Broadcom acquisition of AirWatch. There's a lot of customers that are not too looking forward to that. Uh, the potential <laughs> changes there that. Um, that's been one that uh, a lot of customers are kind of reaching out to have some exploratory conversations about that. Um, and that professional service engagement uh, is a, a really good option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just helped a customer uh, because of that, because their price was going up like four times what it was before. Um, and they had like thousands of assignment groups and applications and everything. So we had to replicate everything over from workspace one to jam pro all those objects and that's just apart from even the device migration that's a whole nother piece but just getting all of those objects into jam pro so that they get all the apps they need they had yeah th their devices were like on average in 50 different assignment groups so we had to get all that information over